Our next speaker works with small business owners, startups, and major corporations to create valuable brand and web experiences. Please welcome senior product designer at Trello, Stu Smith. So I work at Trello, which is part of Atlassian. We've got to have some awesome Atlassian teammates here with me. But I want to start out just saying, you know, I'm a remote employee. And this is what I had to do two days ago. This is the ironic thing. I had to travel 15,000 kilometers to be here, 22 hours. Oh my gosh, my whole job is done over video. What am I doing here? Anyway, hilarious for me, but I kind of digress. Uh, I just thought I had to point that out that, you know, I don't really see people often. I, like I said, work on Trello, which basically organizes my entire brain. So of course, I organize my talk with Trello. And I wanted to get started with my story, but before that, I want to get some context from the room. So like I mentioned, I'm a full-time remote employee. Can I just do the like show of hands thing? Who gets to work remotely like one day a month? I heard everybody? Yeah, it looks like half, something like that. Uh, raise your hand again if you work remotely like one day a week. Okay, so kind of actually the same number, that's cool. Uh, what if you're like me and it's a full-time gig? Okay, so I think I counted like eight. So that's, that's awesome, it's, it trickled down a little bit. Um, that helps me uh, have some context and I'm really happy to do that. I'm gonna tell you my story. You know, now that we've gotten to know each other a little bit, it's a love story about remote work. And it starts kind of like a lot of other love stories where there's a little bit of heartache, a little bit of uncomfortable stuff. Um, I used to work in startups like this. <laughs> so, yeah, I used to work in these little disruptive startups uh, for about four years that were super fast paced. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things that happens when you're in those startups. They're super exciting, everything feels possible, everything's exciting. And it's really awesome for a while, but after four years of that, if you went to Andy's talk, I kind of experienced some of those things he was talking about. I just got burnt out on that continual cycle. And you know, those companies need really highly committed, uh, highly performant team members. And as I was working in this environment, I actually learned some stuff about myself. I actually learned this, that I don't think I'm actually comfortable in offices, and I don't think I've ever actually been comfortable in offices. And I tend to have a lot of anxiety being in an office, which led to some burnout. So there's a few contributing things to what really burnt me out about working in an office. First of all, routine. We're gonna to touch on this a little bit later in depth. But that thing of just doing the same thing every single day, the grind of that. Honestly, like the noise of an office, especially a startup, you have like a sales team playing ping pong next to you on a headset, doing their pitch to a customer. That was a real thing for me. Andy touched on this in his talk, the pressure to stay late. So that's like happy hours, but it's also you're sitting and you have the CEO of the company who's grinding it out. His job is on the line. He's got investors to please and he's there till 7, 8 p.m. Yeah, you end up staying that late. Endless interruptions, that same ping pong playing sales team uh, probably hops over your, to your desk and asks for a new feature at random. But then the biggest thing for me was family FOMO. So, this picture was taken a year ago. I'm a dad of three, which is as crazy as it sounds. But my kids are huge compared to this photo last year. And so as I'm doing this whole thing where I'm at the office uh, in an environment that doesn't make me feel that comfortable, where it's getting me burnt out, I'm missing out on a lot of this stuff that's happening every single day. So I actually went to my manager and negotiated a remote schedule so that I could work out of this thing in my backyard that Amy was talking about. It's a vintage restored Airstream, and it's my design utopia. I get to go in here and just sit and be quiet and get away from all those things that I was talking about in the office that were dragging me down. And after I negotiated this sort of remote thing with my company, I was there for a couple of months and really just loving it, that like first two to three month span. It got me out of that routine that I was talking about. I didn't have to get up and hustle out the door. I didn't have to do traffic. Y'all, it's insane here. I saw this quote when I was researching this, that <laughs> traffic is measured in hours, not kilometers. I thought that was a joke until I went to the Atlassian office. 
But yeah, so you do this commute, you do your work, you get back in the commute. And in my experience, going even partially remote, I was able to start my days a little bit slower. My routine became making coffee the slow way, hanging out with those kids. If you don't have experience being around little kids, they're freshest in the morning. That's when they have the most energy. They're less grumpy. So I got more of that time. I go take my commute to my office. And then I break away to play Legos in the afternoon in between calls. Like, it's a pretty badass thing. But then I had this real record scratch moment that happened about three months into working remote on my partial schedule. And it relates to my dad. So my dad's the guy on the left. You know, handsome fella. I'm halfway to being his age, so maybe I'll look like that in the future. But last September, he had a stroke while he was recovering from a surgery. And if you've never been around a stroke victim, it literally changes everything. He was paralyzed on his left side, couldn't speak clearly, and he's a very driven person. A lot of like the drive I get from, uh, or the, a lot of the drive I have comes from him. And so he was just deeply frustrated by this situation of being completely helpless, not able to do anything for himself. And so I live in Austin, Texas, was up there on the left. He lives down here in Houston on the right. You can see it's about two and a half hours. That's best case scenario apart. And so what I had to do is I had to take that partial remote thing and then actually do that full time for a month and stay in the hospital with him and help him recover from this really traumatic thing. Happy to report that he has made a complete recovery. It's awesome. That has a happy ending. But this experience taught me that remote doesn't have just a benefit for me, like convenience of getting away from a noisy office. It actually has this benefit to my family. And when the opportunity came around to work at Trello, I want to jump on it. Trello's famous for its remote culture. It's a full-time remote job. And just this year, after working at Trello for a year, I've collaborated with people in 12 different states, four different countries. 75% of Trello is remote. It's a pretty amazing thing. And we're going to talk about some of the practices that Trello does to make remote work work. Um, but yeah, it's a really awesome thing. So if you're a cynic and you're hearing me talk about remote work, you've heard my story about how I love this way of working, you might be thinking, that's cool. It sounds like it really benefits the designer in this situation, but how about communities? How about businesses? Well, I'm here to say that remote challenges can, or changes communities and businesses. I mentioned I live in Austin, Texas. If you don't know much about this town, it's a really cool, hip, happening place. But we've had so many people move to town that we've outgrown our in infrastructure by US standards, the traffic's pretty insane there. And then we add on to it that we do these humongous festivals. Uh, this is Austin City Limits Festival. Andy touched on South by Southwest. Each of these happens and brings a couple hundred thousand people to Austin, which is like 10% of our population added during these events. And so can you guess what the one thing is that they do to curb this traffic? Probably spoiler that we're talking about remote work. Yeah, it's remote work. So our mayor will say, when these events come to town, stay at home. Encourage your employees to work at home. And it's been so successful that it's actually become a long-term mobility strategy for us. So policy is changing in Austin to incentivize remote work. We're going to be giving huge benefits to companies that, over the next 20 years, put their people remote. On that topic of giving incentives, which means money, remote saves money, Aetna, which is a huge insurance company in the US, experimented with remote. They took a lot of their teams remote, and then they ended up saving uh, 2.7 million square feet of office space by doing that, which translates to 78 million bucks a year in rent. It's insane. And then they also found that their remote workers were more productive, and that's incredible. And then this is one thing that we found at Atlassian. We have those productive remote workers, but we also have five times more of them to choose from. We have a more diverse pool of talent to choose from when we put remote options out there. That's been successful. If you want to work remotely, pay attention to Atlassian. We're going to have three times the distributed teams in the next three years. And this is all sort of why remote is exploding globally, in my opinion. Even we see this, we kind of had this when we raised our hands, about half of us here in India work at home at least one day a week. So I don't know if I fully convinced you about this remote thing, but we'll just pretend that we've all agreed that remote is awesome, here to stay. But the rest of the time, needs to be talking about like how we are effective in this environment. 
So I'm a former professional musician. The first time I came to India was to play with a rock band, which was really awesome. Not at this scale, this is Tame Impala, which is way cooler than any band I was ever in. But having this perspective of being a musician and a performer makes me think about things sort of through that lens. And if you look at this situation here that we're looking at, there's sort of some elements at play. We have the venue, so where the performance is happening. We have the stage on which it's happening, which has all the cool lighting and sound, instruments. And then we have the performers themselves that are very skilled. And I think we can actually map this to work. And so keep this metaphor in your mind that organizations are the ones that create the venue for effective remote work. Leaders help set the stage, so kind of like amplifying the work of the designers there. And then we as designers can actually hone our skills as remote workers. So let's dig in on each of these. And I want to point out before I dig in a little bit more that each of these are actually just people, right? So this is remote is a people situation. It's not just corporate. It's, you know, it's a real negotiation and give and take between each of these sides. OK, so how do organizations build the venue for remote work? The first one is around creating standards. So set the rules of engagement and leave no one out. Trello, like I mentioned, has all these awesome standards and ways of working. And I'm going to take you through just three of them. So the first one is assuming remote. So that means if one person is remote, then everyone is. And it's because we hate this situation. So if you've ever been in this room, you're like the floating head on the wall. The CEO's there with her exec team, and she's presenting. And you're the, this awkward person that's trying to butt in, trying to show your work. And it feels weird, of course, and it has a name. So it's this thing called presence disparity. So people don't have equal footing in this call. They don't, aren't equally represented. And if you've been this person floating up on the wall, you know it's hard to actually get your voice across. So this is how we do it at Trello. This is the Zoom Mr. Rogers mode, or yeah, uh, Brady Bunch mode. Yep, that's a different thing. Anyway, on this call, we have differing levels of seniority. This is an AMA we were doing with the UX expert, Jared Spool. The point is, each of us is equal on the call. Nobody is uh, given priority over the other. No one's left out in this situation. The next one we are really passionate about is having shared working hours. So we believe that time zone overlap is critical for collaboration. Other companies like 37 Signals do a really amazing asynchronous remote thing. If you're interested in that, go check them out. But for us in particular, we sort of believe that teams that are formed like this don't necessarily work the best. We believe that teams that are formed like this remotely can work effectively. So for me, what this looks like is I work with a product manager in San Francisco and then an engineering manager in Paris. And then we have an agreed upon set of hours that is 11 to 5 uh, Eastern time, so New York City time. And that gives us enough shared overlap time during the day with some hours on either end to where we can actually collaborate in real time and share things together. So lastly, we have a standard around having a place to focus. I have my Airstream. When I was interviewing at Trello, they asked me about having a door to my office because we have this belief that great work doesn't really happen out of cafes all the time. It doesn't happen when your roommate's passing by or when your kid's passing by or partner. You actually have to have a place that you can get heads down. You're going to be constantly on video calls, and you need that space to focus. So for me, you met my kids earlier. They don't care if I have a door. They're going to come in anyway. So I actually developed this thing that's a little on-air sign, and it lives in my kitchen, and it's hooked up to my Google Calendar. And whenever uh, I have a meeting start, it turns red, and that means don't interrupt daddy. It's pretty awesome. So I've had to like hack this a little bit, and it's pretty fun. It works like sometimes. <laughs> They're still kids. And then, OK, organizations. You can build the venue by funding the right tools. So we as designers are probably annoyingly opinionated about the things that we use when we work. These are sort of the tools that I use day to day, and I want to touch on a couple of them. A lot of them are things that we use, like I assume all of us use Slack probably. But yeah, all tools are not created equal. So we recently switched to Figma. And it's not really because the design experience is necessarily better inside of Figma. It's that we can share the same canvas. It's this really magical thing. I mentioned I have my two close collaborators spread across, across the globe. And I could be working on the same file with them in real time 
which honestly is better than them being in the same office because we're looking at the same thing as it's happening. The next big thing is Mural. So this is not a design tool at Trello, it's a organization tool. So we use this for digital whiteboarding with each other. So designers, we love like putting sticky notes up on the wall. You don't get to do that. It, I mean, if you're doing it at home, it's fine just for yourself. But this allows some transport, transportability of those ideas and everyone on the Trello team uses Mural. The point here is that your team member, if your team members, if you're working remotely, are going to have opinions about how this works. So it's about listening and funding the tools that actually facilitate that work environment. Okay, so the last big thing is making space for together togetherness. So Trello does this really amazing thing called Trello Together, which brings our 200 plus team together in one location every year. It's a big, important cultural event, and we don't pack it full of meetings. We pack it full of like drinking beers and playing in kayaks and playing basketball together, and of course, taking silly team photos. But it, it's one of these events that helps us build camaraderie throughout the year, and we really don't believe that really effective teams can function without some face-to-face -face time. Okay, so we talked about organizations. Let's talk about leaders. If you're this guy, remote work scares the shit out of you. If you're a micromanager that wants to be over the, the shoulder, you have for sure asked this either out loud or in your own head, how do I know if people are working if they're all at home? So I'm gonna try and give leaders in the room, touched on design leadership earlier today, a couple of practical things that you can do. So, spoiler, it begins with trust. That's a big thing if you're that micromanager Trust is the thing that's actually at play there. And I love Brene Brown, she's awesome, also a fellow Texan, and she has this quote that trust is built in very small moments, which is true because in, particularly in remote work, you have just these small touch points with people. You may have a call on, a, on Zoom and then next week you might see that person again. You don't have these things in passing where you're passing someone in the hallway and building relationships as you go. So how does a manager build trust remotely? First of all, it's setting expectations, kind of similar to those standards we were talking about. A manager can say, hey, this is how I need you to actually report, and this is where I'm benchmarking you. This is the way that I'd like you to work and communicate with me. But the point is, don't leave it up for in interpretation. You know, we don't see each other when we're not on the same call. And then providing feedback. So no one should be guessing about their performance in a remote environment. That's one of the big challenges working remotely is you can feel disconnected from the team and you're like, am I stacking up? I don't even see the other designers you know, over, over across the room. I don't know what they're doing. And so you need to be regularly talking about what's working and what's not working. And then here's the painful part. You actually have to invite your team to give you feedback. So you have to be asking, as a manager, how am I doing at this thing? Am I actually managing the team well remotely? How can I improve? And on that front, being human is huge. Again, talked about how much I love Brene Brown. She talks about being vulnerable. You can't have to bring your whole self to this relationship, especially remotely. It's a great managerial practice to begin with to not guard yourself off. But remotely, you need to actually, in those kind of recurring one-on-ones that you have, you need to be really open about what's happening with you and your life to help build that trust. So my manager, Mark, and I will regularly spend the first 15 minutes of our one-on-one our -on -one every Thursday morning just kind of talking about what's happening in life. It's awesome. You can actually add more distance to the remote environment if you close yourself off. Okay, so the next big thing is being willing to experiment. You know, we all iterate as designers, but we should do this as leaders in remote companies, recognizing that it's not going to be perfect right away, so we should iterate. So I worked in this company where this bombshell moment happened. There was one day where three senior people quit to take remote jobs. Like, holy crap, you're a leader in this company. What do you do? This is like a threat to the workforce now. And they had to experiment. They were sort of forced to take this on and figure it out. And so I really liked what they did. They ran a three-month test. They had three departments go remote. Then they benchmarked performance. They surveyed the teams and figured out what was working, and that led them to their policy. And then the last big thing, and I saw this within that same company, is you can actually hire for remote. 
so you can hire high performers that change the culture. Same thing as if you were hiring a principal or lead designer, senior, senior designer to your team. People with experience bring different practices, different perspectives, and so if remote is important and you're sort of taking a company remote, this is a strategy that you can employ. And it was important when I was joining Trello that we actually, that I actually had some experience as a remote employee. So I'm talking about this experience and you're like, what does that mean? How do I develop that? Or how do I get better at remote? Designers, this is your time now. So how do designers actually hone their skill for remote? The first one is communicating often. So replace being there with being really active in your communication. Alistair Simpson, who's one of the heads of design at Atlassian, has a great quote that design is 90% communication and 10% doing the work. And this is huge. What I want to point out is that there's, of course, ways that you can become a better writer. There's ways that you can get better at speaking. There's ways to get better at the technical side of communication. The thing that you could do on Monday when you get back, if you're that person that raised your hand and said, yeah, I work at home one day a week, you could start communicating more often. That's easy. In your same medium, just communicate more often. Here's an example of what my work looks like in relation to this. This is a Confluence post. We made some updates to due date reminders. And this was me not necessarily like providing justification, but publicizing my rationale of all the different things that I had thought of and all the things that I had tried. And the point here is that I have to do this work because I don't see the stakeholders in passing. I don't get to bounce my ideas off of them. So I have to really document that. And on top of that, this feeds into this next point that designers need to work openly. So we as designers kind of fall into this thing where we get trapped by big reveals. So a big reveal is that moment that we've all had where we've worked on something for two weeks. We're proud of it. It represents us who we are as people. Our egos are tied up into it. We show our design director, and he or she is like, yeah, not quite. Go back to the drawing board and you know, use these new inputs. So those big reveals are the enemy in remote work. Because again, you don't have this common interaction with those people. And you have to build trust in the moments that you get. So, you know, in an office, you get to see these people every day, but you actually need to invite those same people into your process as a remote worker. So this quote resonates with me. Open collaboration encourages greater accountability, which in turn fosters trust. So Atlassian has this value around being open company, no bullshit. And what that means to me as a designer is not waiting until my work is perfect to show it off. Like I was mentioning, I have those collaborators where they're looking at my Figma file, and it's awesome. They're seeing work that's minutes old, not two weeks old, and I have to hold on to my work very loosely instead of saying, this is a precious thing that I'm ready to present. Okay, last thing, and this may not sound like a skill, but you have to work actively to prioritize relationships. And it's being deliberate about making time. Your life as a remote worker ends up looking like this. A little less cute than maybe this amazing illustration, but you end up spending all of your time on video calls. So when you're in that mindset, you tend to go on a video call and you're like, okay, we have to talk about these things, get these things done right now, get the call over because we have an hour scheduled. But what you have to do is actually build time for off topic, social time. Again, I keep going back to this thing. You don't have those touch points in person. So you have to be deliberate about making that time. The Trello design team does a thing called Design Studio every Thursday afternoon where we do some really silly stuff. This is a GIF battle Trello board. You can get this in the Trello template gallery, which is really fun. But what goes on here is we have different rounds where you go to Giphy and type different prompts. My favorite one is type your name plus the word weird, and then it comes up, and then you post it on there, and then we vote on the Trello board and you get crowned the Giphy champion. And so it's a really fun thing. You know, you have a whole team of designers there. It's like a very expensive meeting, a lot of like time that we have. But it's so necessary for getting us in between those touch points where we see each other in person. So to wrap this all up, again, using that metaphor of a performance and how that maps to work, organizations are the ones that create the venue for remote work. Leaders help set the stage and amplify those remote employees. And then designers can actually hone their skill to be better in the remote environment. 
Resource that I want to leave, leave you with. This thing is awesome. This is Remote Indian. It's a Slack group. So if you're interested in going remote, maybe you're partially remote, it's about 400 Indians in this group that share resources, share learning, share best practices, share opportunities for new uh, remote jobs. They let me in, so they'll probably let you in, I'm sure, since you know I'm not from here. And the thing that I want to leave with you with is probably one of my favorite quotes of all time. So perfect is the enemy of the good. So if you're becoming a remote employee, if you're trying this out as an organization, remote and getting great at remote work is a journey. So it's about continually learning and iterating. And I'm hoping that my time with you today at least gets you starting thinking about how you're going to take this journey. Thanks, everybody.